I sort of um, found myself uh, reluctantly at the center of the larger, uh, very contentious uh, debate over human-caused climate change because of this figure, uh, this uh, graph that my co-authors and I published uh, more than a decade and a half ago, uh, the hockey stick. And it sort of um, it put me, thrust me into a, a, a world that's very different from the world that most scientists are trained in and are comfortable in uh, sort of being in, um, from the, the world of science to the world of politics. And so I'm going to talk about some of my experiences, uh, again, at, at the center of the sort of uh, the climate change debate, um, some of the lessons that I've learned along the way, and um, some of the reasons that I'm actually optimistic that despite uh, some of the challenges we've had in confronting uh, the threat of climate change, um, reasons that I'm optimistic that we're actually going to meet that challenge. So let me start out by pointing out that uh, the science is actually relatively straightforward. So despite the fact that climate change is a very societally contentious issue, it's a politically contentious issue, the science, the basic underlying science is not contentious, it's not controversial. The greenhouse effect, we've known about it for nearly two centuries. Uh, Joseph Fourier, uh, the same scientist who discovered the law of heat conduction in the early 1800s, he understood that there was a greenhouse effect. In over two centuries, we have simply been refining our understanding of the, of the scientific details, but the basic science, the science of the greenhouse effect, is, is not contested. The fact that we're increasing the greenhouse effect, increasing CO2 concentrations through fossil fuel burning and other human activities, again, it, it's incontrovertible. And this is one of those graphs that you really have to replot every year. Um, I created this a few years ago. I haven't gone back to do the nice animation. It's a little bit of work. And so it gets out of date very quickly. Um, in fact, it's so out of date that you have to add another vertical tick mark to the scale because we just crossed 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere up here for the first time in what we think is millions of years, just two years ago. Um, we are engaged in this unprecedented and uncontrolled experiment with the one planet that we know in the universe um, supports life. So, okay, the greenhouse effect, fundamental physics, chemistry, we've known for two centuries. The fact that we're increasing the greenhouse effect, again, there's no question about that. What we wouldn't be able to explain, what I as a scientist could not explain to you would be if the Earth were not warming up as a result of that. And the fact that it is, it's warmed up a little less than a degree Celsius, is not the evidence for human-caused climate change. It's the confirmation, really, of, that we have the science right, that we understand what's going on. Now, for a long time, critics were pointing to the fact that uh, we hadn't really uh, warmed as much as the models might have suggested uh, we would uh, over a period of about a decade or so. It got labeled the hiatus, the, uh, the pause. Um, it led uh, contrarians in the climate change debate to uh, insist that global warming had stopped. Um, well, no, global warming didn't stop. And in fact, last year, um, in the headlines, uh, some of you may have seen, we broke the record, the warmest year on record, 2014. Uh, and so when you plot 2014 on the scale, you see that, yes, there are fluctuations from year to year, but we remain very much on this trajectory of warming about 2.2 degrees Celsius per decade. Now, it turns out that 2014 uh, will no longer be a record this year. In fact, NOAA just came out today and said we now can say there's a 97% chance that 2015 will be the warmest year on record. And if you want to know where 2015 is so far, it's about here. And it's boosted by an El Nino event, just like 1998 was boosted by an El Nino event. But what's happening is now when we get an El Nino event, it's not just warm, it's record warm. And we, can, we continue on this trajectory. And if you don't believe the thermometer measurements, again, there are critics. There are critics who don't accept the thermometer measurements. They don't accept the instrumental records. I could show you dozens of independent lines of evidence that all tell an internally consistent story of a planet that is warming up and a climate that is changing, 
uh, much as we expect it to, as we continue to increase the concentrations of these gases in the atmosphere. And that's the sort of evidence that has led the rather conservative IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is an organization um, uh, uh, that uh, represents uh, literally uh, hundreds of scientists around the world. It sort of, the, the reports of the IPCC reflect sort of a, a scientific lowest common denominator of what all of these scientists can agree upon. And so the reports by construction, by uh, their nature, are uh, typically rather conservative. And so when the IPCC says that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal, that means that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. <laughs> they mean what they say. They say what they mean. Now, is that all invalidated because we've had some cold winters back east where I live um, in recent uh, years? Well, you might think that based on some of the responses we've seen, some of the public discourse, um, some of the headlines, interviews, a uh, statement by the next president of the United States. Uh, <laughs> Well, maybe, we'll see. Um, it's a climate change denier. Um, well, so everywhere I go, and I apologize, I couldn't actually find the records for Vancouver. Uh, I have uh, records for most of the um, cities in the US. Um, everywhere I go, I try to get a hold of the actual data that shows what's happening to unusual cold, what's happening to record cold temperatures. And guess what? Everywhere I go, they're decreasing, as we would expect. As the globe warms, record cold gets less and less common, record warmth gets more and more common. Um, it's true at State College, where I live. And in the US, in America, North America, southern part of North America, United States. Central. Central North America, exactly. We're really just a very small part of uh, North America. Um, there's a saying, you know, how does it play in Peoria? Has anyone heard that expression? How does it play? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, a, a city in Illinois, and it's supposed to represent the heartland of America. And if you really want to get your fingers on the pulse of the U.S., you see what's happening in Peoria. So let's see what's happening in Peoria. Uh, yep, record cold is on the decline in Peoria, Illinois. Now, if you look at the pattern, while you know, the critics have been complaining about some cold temperatures in the eastern US um, in uh, some recent winters, um, uh, you, of course, haven't felt that. You've been feeling record warmth. Because that's what happens when the jet stream undulates, when it has to do with just natural variability in the atmosphere. If one place is particularly cold, then another place is probably going to be particularly warm. And that's been true of the western US. It's been true of Alaska. It's been true of a large part of the Arctic. Uh, and that's contributing, in fact, to the acceleration of the loss of Arctic sea ice. Now, there's an interesting debate going on within the climate research community right now as to whether it's possible that this pattern that gives us cold temperatures in the eastern US uh, in the winter, um, that gives us unusual warmth in western North America, that brings the jet stream north, that's all that warmth is coming uh, to Alaska and Canada because the jet stream isn't going through California and it's denying California all of that moisture and all that snowpack that they rely upon. Um, and that's, that same pattern is responsible uh, for the record drought uh, that we've seen in California. Um, could that relate to, for example, the melting of Arctic sea ice? Could that be changing the pattern of the jet stream in a way that favors that uh, particular pattern? What's well, possible? There's some science that uh, suggests that that's the case. But while we've been cold, uh, you've been setting records out here in, Victor in uh, Vancouver um, because it's part of that same pattern. All right, so nothing that I've said thus far depends on theoretical climate models. The critics will sometimes tell you that uh, our entire sort of understanding of the issue of global warming and climate change is based on these uh, untrustworthy uh, climate models. And the statement is doubly wrong, because as I'll show you shortly, there are reasons to actually trust those models. Um, uh, but it doesn't depend on models. It depends on fundamental physics and chemistry we've known for two centuries, irrefutable measurements that tell us we're increasing the concentrations of these greenhouse gases, and the fact that the Earth is indeed warming up as we expect it to. That's really all you need to know to know that climate change is real, the globe is warming, it's caused by human activity. But we'd use climate models. Um, they're sort of our 
crystal ball, right? Uh, we have only one planet, and as I said before, we are engaged in an uncontrolled experiment with the one planet that we have. If we want to um, pose hypotheses, test hypotheses about the way the climate works, um, about the role that natural factors might be having in climate change, uh, the role of human activity. Um, these climate models allow us to pose hypotheses, to test hypotheses. Now, at this point you're probably wondering why, you all recognize, I'm sure there are people here. <laughs> What's that from? Seinfeld. Right, the Seinfeld Show. Okay, well, three years before the Seinfeld Show went on the air, Back in 1988, Dr. James Hansen, director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, somewhere up there, in the upper floors of this building, where the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies is located, was running a climate model uh, that by today's standards was uh, quite primitive, in fact. Um, and as uh, Niels Bohr once uh, famously said, um, predictions are hard especially about the future. It is Niels Bohr. He did say that. Um, and Hansen made a prediction about the future using a climate model that by today's standards, again, is quite crude. Um, you can see the thermometer observations that show the warming leading up to 1988 when he made that prediction. And what he did is he ran the model three different times under three different future scenarios. After all, Hansen, you know, is not a clairvoyant. <laughs> He's not a fortune teller. Uh, he couldn't predict what we would choose to do. But what he could say is, depending on what fossil fuel trajectory we follow, I can tell you how much warming we think we'll see. And he looked at three different scenarios, a low scenario where we sort of got our act together and we acted to, uh, to curtail our burning of fossil fuels. A green, the green is a sort of high scenario where we really accelerated our burning of fossil fuels. And then there's this blue in the middle. Well, it turns out that if you look at the scenarios, that middle scenario comes closest to what we actually did in terms of our fossil fuel burning. We, we ended up somewhere in the middle, and so we'll take away those other two. This is the prediction, more or less, for the warming that Hansen said we would see if we pursued a trajectory of fossil fuel burning that it turns out we actually pursued. And I would say it's a pretty good prediction, decades into the future. Um, and uh, I could show you, well, Hold on for a second. You might look at that, and if you're a pessimist, you might say, well, you know, what's going on here? If this climate model is so great, then how did it not capture this huge event right here in 1991, 1992? Um, and the thermometers show this big cooling event, and it's true that Hansen was unable to predict in 1988 that in 1991, Mount Pinatubo would erupt. <laughs> but when it did erupt, he understood that it would put large amounts of reflective particles in the stratosphere, shield some of the sunlight for a number of years, and cool down the planet. And so what he was um, insightful enough to realize is he had the time to do that experiment too, because it takes about nine months for those volcanic particles to spread out around the globe and begin to cool the surface. He had time to make a prediction with his climate model, and it predicted given the distribution of these volcanic uh, particulates that we would see about a half a degree cooling for several years. So what might look like a flaw in his original prediction was actually an example of another successful test with this primitive climate model. And I could bore you to tears discussing the hundreds of pages of model validation exercises in the various reports of the IPCC. The bottom line is there's reason to take these models seriously. They have been tested, and they've passed tests with flying colors in flying color. So let's use those models to test some hypotheses. Now, at this point, you know, if you're a critic, you might say, OK, so the globe is warmed. How do we know it isn't those natural factors? And I just talked about Mount Pinatubo, these volcanoes. They can cool the climate. If they change over time, you could get a, a warming trend if there are fewer volcanoes. Um, there are small but measurable changes in uh, how bright the sun is. Uh, we can measure them with satellites. We can actually extend them further back with information um, from uh, 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 sunspot data, uh, from uh, cosmogenic isotopes, radiocarbon. We can reconstruct that. And so you can actually take the climate models and you can feed it the volcanic eruptions over the past century. You can feed it our estimated changes in solar output and ask the models, okay, what happens 
If you feed it the actual history of those two natural factors, uh, the models want to cool. The models actually want to cool over the latter part of the 20th century because there have been a number of big eruptions like Pinatubo, like El Chichon in 1982. Um, solar output has been flat or even has declined slightly. So when you feed the model just the natural factors, um, the models tend to want to cool rather than warm. And in fact, it's only when you add the human impact of increasing greenhouse gas concentrations that you're able to explain uh, the warming seen in the models. And that's the sort of evidence, and there are many other examples of fingerprints. It isn't just the overall warming, it's the pattern, the vertical pattern of the warming, the spatial uh, pattern of the warming around the globe. Um, there are unique fingerprints that distinguish the effect of greenhouse warming from other natural factors. And it turns out the fingerprints match human activity. They implicate humans. They don't implicate the natural factors. They rule out the natural factors. And that's the sort of evidence that led, again, the rather staid IPCC to conclude in the most recent report that it is extremely likely. The IPCC hates to use terminology like extremely likely. <laughs> that's really going out on a limb for them. So when they say it's extremely likely, they mean it's extremely likely. Really extremely likely. In fact, even here, when they say it's extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid-20th century, they're being overly conservative once again. Uh, because if you actually read the technical chapter that this statement is based on, what that chapter shows is that we are most likely responsible for more than 100% of the warming that we have seen. And we already, already have seen the reason for that, because the natural factors were actually pushing us in the other direction, and we warmed in spite of that. So. You know, when they say, well, at least 70, at least 80 percent, um, if you pin them down, they'll say the IPCC, you know, says most likely it's more than 100 <laughs> percent. All right, so what about our future? What's going to happen to the planet if we continue to burn fossil fuels? Well, if we could stop burning fossil fuels right now in an imaginary world where we could hold CO2 concentrations, we could freeze them at their current concentration, turns out we'd probably still get another half a degree of warming or so. That's, we call that the committed warming. Um, in fact, uh, Kirsten here has done quite a bit of work on, on uh, the issue of committed warming uh, because the oceans are continuing to warm up in response to the greenhouse gases we've already put into the atmosphere. The climate system is still coming into equilibrium. Um, it takes a number of decades. Um, so we would still get another half a degree Celsius, but we would most likely avoid the two degrees Celsius mark right here. So I'll come back to that. Two degrees Celsius turns out to be a critical number. It's a number that many of the scientists who have studied climate change impacts, it's a number that the EU and many other observers have said, that's probably as good a definition as we have of dangerous climate change, anything more than two degrees C. You could make an argument for a much lower uh, number. If you're Tuvalu, if you're a low-lying uh, Pacific Island nation, current warming is already dangerous. If you're California, current warming is already dangerous. If you're Vancouver, current warming in some ways is already dangerous. And if we continue with business as usual, we don't enact any policies to curtail our burning of fossil fuels, then we're talking, in, in, what I like speaking in uh, outside of the US is I can use Celsius. <laughs> I don't have to do the conversion to Fahrenheit for this audience. Four to five degrees, by the way, that is seven to nine degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> <laughs> Five, five to, uh, so four to five degrees Celsius warming of the planet. Okay, now if you're the IPCC, you like to use, you know, quantitative thermometer graphs that show how bad two degrees warming would be, how bad five degrees warming. You can see five degrees warming, if you look at the various impacts of the climate sh that the IPCC assesses, you're deep in the red zone. That's really bad. Really bad things happen at four to five degrees. Pretty bad things are happening at two degrees C. Uh, but a picture is worth a thousand words. So, you know, what are we talking about? In a world where we allow the globe to warm four to five degrees Celsius by the end of the century, um, in the words of James Hansen, who I mentioned earlier, uh, we will be leaving behind for our children and our grandchildren uh, a different planet, fundamentally a different planet. It, it won't be the planet we grew up on. Now, I used to end this sequence with the polar bear um, because it, it's the law. You have to show a polar bear <laughs> stranded on an ice floe and talk about climate change. 
but uh, by making the polar bear sort of the poster child of climate change, I think in some ways we've wrongly conveyed to the public um, this notion that climate change is this exotic, far off problem that maybe it'll be a, a problem for polar bears sometime in the future, but you know, it's not, it's not hurting me, it's not harming me, right? Well, that's wrong. And so everywhere I go now and I talk about climate change, and it's not hard to do, it really is not hard to do, everywhere I go, I can find a compelling example of how climate change is already hurting us. Um, a couple of years ago, I gave this talk um, in San uh, Angelo, Texas, right in the center of Texas. And I wanted an image that really captured the 2011 uh, Texas and Oklahoma drought, unprecedented drought. Um, and by the way, scientists who study who compare models and observations have shown it's very likely that that drought was, was exacerbated. It wouldn't have been the record drought that it was in the absence of human-caused climate change. And so I found this image on the web, and that, you know, I said, that's a great image of the 2011 Texas drought, and I showed it to the audience, and then somebody pointed out to me that that was actually from San Angelo. Um, it's a lake that they used to call Lake Fisher. It's no longer a lake. It disappeared in 2011. Um, drought, and uh, now in San Angelo, uh, at least for several years, their water had to be trucked in. Uh, most of the water that they actually had was being used for fracking, <laughs> and so drinking water had to be had to be trucked in. In, Ma in Maine, um, where you know the iconic species of Maine, the moose is threatened by climate change. Um, article in the New York Times talking about. In the UK, um, I was uh, in the UK last year. Um, the UK Met Office, again, you, you talk about the IPCC being conservative, you can't find a more conservative group than the people at the UK Met Office. And so when the UK Met Office said that the 2012 uh, UK flooding event wouldn't have happened in the absence of human-caused climate change, um, you can believe that it would not have happened in the absence of human-caused climate change. Uh, when I've been to Florida a couple times talking about climate change, you don't have to convince Floridians that they're seeing the impacts of climate change. Um, this is the, these are the streets of Miami Beach, and there's an annual, uh, actually semi-annual, uh, high tide, the King Tide, uh, that uh, typically, um, you know, it's, it's a seasonal high tide that, uh, that impacts Miami Beach. Um, and it happens, you know, the same time, around the same time every year, but it didn't used to flood the streets of Miami Beach when it happened, and now it does. And that's the way we're going to see the effects of sea level rise. It isn't going to be just some slow, gradual inundation. The extreme events are going to be more extreme. Um, what they used to call nuisance flooding um, will become essentially permanent flooding. It'll force a retreat from the coastline, uh, whether it's Miami Beach, whether it's any number of major coastal cities around the world as we continue to see rising sea levels. If you go to California, um, you know, you don't have to convince them that uh, climate change is real. Uh, the drought that we're seeing in California right now, folks who've looked at tree ring data um, have told us that that drought was a, almost certainly the worst drought in at least 1,200 years, as far back as they could go. Um, and, and that isn't a coincidence. Now, you find some scientists who will say, well, we can't prove that the particular atmospheric circulation pattern that led to low precipitation uh, during this period couldn't have happened naturally at some level of likelihood, uh, yada, yada. Um, the bottom line is it was the driest year on record and it was the warmest year on record in California. And it was that combination of low precipitation extreme warmth, meaning more evaporation, meaning no snowpack and no meltwater in the spring, that combination of factors uh, was certainly impacted by climate change. And I don't think I have to convince you folks um, here. Uh, of course, there's the infamous 210 uh, Olympics where they had to helicopter in ice um, because in snow because there was no uh, snow in the middle of winter. Um, in British Columbia. Uh, then, of course, the drought, the wildfires that have afflicted uh, California, they haven't escaped um, Washington, Oregon, and British Columbia. And in fact, uh, just a month ago, I came across this article, um, and probably a number of you saw the uh, smoke in downtown Vancouver that was a product of um, this um, you know, massive uh, forest burning 
uh, that in the, the forest burning is, it's almost a triple whammy. Um, in many regions, you have weakened forests because of blights like the pine bark beetle uh, infestations that um, are happening because these pests can survive the warmer winters. So you've got more fuel, you've got high temperatures, and you've got low rainfall. And that's a perfect storm, as it were, for wildfire. And it's not surprising that we are seeing an escalation of wildfires in the western US. So why no action? If the, the evidence is this clear, the science is this clear, if the f evidence that we are already seeing negative impacts of climate change is this clear, why is it that we haven't really acted, at least at a global scale, um, in a meaningful way? And of course, that's a rhetorical question. We all sort of know the answer to that. Um, there is a powerful you know, industry, the fossil fuel industry, that understandably is pretty happy with the status quo. They're pretty happy with our, um, to quote former President George W. Bush, um, our addiction to fossil fuels. Um, those are his words, not mine. Um, um, they're pretty happy with that addiction. They're profiting greatly from that uh, addiction. And uh, I don't know if you, any of you came across um, a story that just broke over the last couple uh, days, Exxon Mobil. So there's a, a media organization that spent several months um, investigating internal documents from Exxon Mobil, and what they were able to show was back in 1980, Exxon Mobil's own scientists were telling them, this is real. Climate change is real. This is happening. It, it is caused by the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. One of them said, it would be unethical for us to not come out with this information. But what did they choose to do? Well, they chose to do what Frank Luntz, a Republican pollster, told uh, fossil fuel companies they needed to do if they didn't want to see uh, regulation of carbon emissions. They needed to convince the public that the science was grossly uncertain, too uncertain to, uh, for, to enact policy. Um, they needed to cultivate experts with impressive credentials who were willing to debunk the scientists, their fellow scientists who are willing to call into question the basic science of climate. They needed to establish front groups. Um, in fact, there's one, unfortunately, that shares a name with uh, Simon Fraser, uh, the Fraser Institute here in Canada. You've got the Heartland Institute in the U.S. You've got the um, uh, you know, there's a whole laundry list, and, and, and often they have the same P.O. box in Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, so you have all these front groups, you have these paid advocates who have created what uh, my uh, friend Naomi Oreskes has um, called a uh, Potemkin village, a fake village of, um, of climate change denialism. It crumbles like a house of cards, but it gives them plausible deniability in saying, well, you know, the science is still contested. Now, if this sounds familiar, um, if it sounds like a familiar strategy, then it may be because it is a familiar strategy. And in fact, what ExxonMobil was caught doing over the last few days was exactly what the tobacco industry did uh, back in the 1950s when their internal research told them that their product was killing people. They said, well, we could either come out and, you know, fess up to this, own up to uh, this, or we could spend millions of dollars in a massive disinformation campaign to attack the scientists, to attack the science, um, to convince the public that climate change, that, that uh, tobacco is not a, a threat. It's the same playbook. And in fact, it might be a little surprising uh, for you to learn that some of the same paid advocates for the fossil fuel industry that are debunking the science of climate change today, we're also doing the same thing for the tobacco industry decades ago. You find the same names in the tobacco documents. They had to turn over their internal documents in response to uh, a lawsuit brought by the attorneys general of several states in the US. So that's the strategy. And so you have powerful um, politicians like uh, the chairman of the uh, Senate Environment and Public Works uh, Committee, James Inhofe of Oklahoma, uh, who has declared climate change to be the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. Um, now, I'm sure it's, it's, it's a coincidence that he does happen to be the largest recipient, or one of the few largest recipients of fossil fuel money in the US Senate. Um, statements like this uh, led him to be the preferred keynote speaker for the Heartland Institute, 
The Heartland Institute is a fossil fuel industry funded front group um, that used to work for the tobacco industry, uh, attacking the science linking their product to human health uh, uh, ailments, and today is working for the fossil fuel industry to um, dispute the link between fossil fuel burning and greenhouse gases and climate change. And they invited James Inhofe to be their keynote speaker in their uh, 2011 um, their, their 2011 uh, annual climate change denial conference in Washington, D.C. <laughs> he had to back out at the last minute. He had gotten uh, ill uh, swimming in a lake back in Oklahoma as a result of the unprecedented heat and drought that Oklahoma was experiencing at the time. They were, uh, the lake was experiencing an, an algal bloom <laughs> uh, as a result of, uh, of the drought and heat, and so he had to cancel out at the last minute. Well, so as you know, uh, I have found myself at the center of this circus-like atmosphere when it comes to the climate change, discourse over climate change, because of this graph that my colleagues and I published a decade and a half ago, the hockey stick. It got a name. It became um, sort of an icon in the climate change debate uh, because it told a simple story. You didn't need to understand the complicated uh, workings of the climate system, the physics of climate, um, how a climate model works, or any of that to sort of understand what this graph was telling us, that there were these unprecedented changes taking place in the climate today, and by inference, probably has something to do with, with human activity. Um, and so it was a threat to, you know, those interests who, um, uh, again, those fossil fuel interests, those advocating for those uh, interests, those who don't want to see the regulation of carbon uh, emissions. Um, uh, Frank Luntz, the pollster, said, you know, as long as you convin can convince the public that um, there's a debate, they will not demand action. But if they begin to think that there's a scientific consensus, they will demand that you act on this problem. Um, and so iconic graphs like this were a threat. Um, and so this was attacked. The hockey stick was attacked viciously. Uh, I have been attacked personally, and I've detailed um, you know, the various uh, experiences I've been subject to in, in the book, uh, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars. Uh, I'll talk about some of those experiences. The first point that I want to make, though, is that there isn't a hockey stick anymore. There's a hockey league something that Canadians can really appreciate. I find the hockey analogy works very well here. Um, there are literally dozens of these reconstructions now using different methods from the ones we use, different data. Um, and while they don't agree on all the details, um, and some of them represent only the land, some of them include the oceans, uh, in every case, they come to the same conclusion. Um, this is from the... Uh, fourth assessment uh, report of the IPCC, that the, the recent warming is unprecedented as far back uh, as they go. Now, there was one development uh, in 2012. Um, there was a study, uh, I think 78 authors from 40 institutions from 22 countries around the world uh, using the most comprehensive database of paleoclimate data yet. And they published a new reconstruction uh, of temperatures uh, spanning the past millennium and came uh, to a very different con con Oh, no, sorry, that's right. They got the same answer we had gotten <laughs> um, a decade and a half ago. Um, and that's the sort of evidence that's led, the, again, the very conservative IPCC to say that, you know, the warming of the last couple decades, it really is without precedent as far back as we can go. Now 1,400 years, um, there are some tentative reconstructions now that go back 10,000 years and they find that there's no precedent for the warming that we've seen. So some people call this politicization of science. I think there's a better term. It's the scientization of politics, the attacks against the hockey stick, the efforts to discredit the science of climate change um, are an example of the scientization of politics. The way that science is now used as a political football is just another way of waging politics. And you know, if you don't like the science as assessed by the IPCC or the US National Academy of Sciences or their counterpart in Canada, uh, in fact, all of the national academies of all the major industrial nations, all of the scientific societies in the US and Canada and Europe um, that have weighed in on the matter, the American Geophysical Union, uh, the American Meteorological Society, the European Physic uh, Geophysical Union, um, 
the American Physical, uh, I mentioned the American Physical Society, the American Chemical Society, um, and, and so on, more than 30 uh, societies. Uh, all have weighed in, climate change is real, it's caused by human activity, and it's gonna be a problem. It's already a problem, and it's gonna be a worse problem if we don't do something about it. That's the conclusion of the world scientists, okay? That is the scientific consensus now. Well, nonetheless, um, you know, because of the inconvenient nature of the hockey stick, um, I have been subject to some interesting um, experiences. Uh, Joe Barton, who was sort of James Inhofe's counterpart in the U.S. House of Representatives. He was the chairman of the House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, and Inhofe, that was the uh, Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. I think I might have got that wrong. He, Barton was the uh, chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee um, from Texas. They call him Smokey Joe Barton because of his environmental record. Uh, and I got a, uh, back in 2005, I got a, a note from Joe Barton. Actually, it was a subpoena. It was a congressional subpoena, really. <laughs> Um, and he wanted to get a hold of all of my personal emails, every document from my scientific career, all the documents from my two senior co-authors whose careers spanned decades, based on the fact that he had read a criticism of our work, of the hockey stick, in that most respected of journals, um, the uh, editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal, <laughs> which uh, isn't, hasn't exactly been friendly to climate science. Um, and interestingly, when Rupert Murdoch, Murdoch took it over, it didn't get any friendlier to climate science. Um, so uh, he actually got a response, not the response he was really expecting, um, AAAS, which by the way had their annual meeting in Vancouver a couple of years ago. Um, around the corner. Um, the American Geophysical Union, American Meteorological Society, the journal Nature, all weighing in, um, calling out what they saw as a transparent effort to intimidate scientists whose findings might be inconvenient to the special interests that fund uh, Mr. Barton's campaign. And again, it might be coincidental that he was the largest recipient of fossil fuel money in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, well, Henry Waxman, uh, progressive Democrat from California who had actually played uh, a key role in bringing the tobacco industry to justice decades ago for hiding the health impacts of their product. He blasted uh, Joe Barton um, for, again, engaging in uh, these, uh, these attacks uh, on scientists. Uh, but it wasn't just progressive Democrats who came out and, and criticized Joe Barton. Sherwood Bollard who was a Republican. He was the chair of another House committee, the House Science Committee. And he used really the strongest words of just about anybody in uh, calling out uh, his fellow Republican, uh, violating um, Ronald Reagan's uh, famous oath, oath uh, Republicans shall not speak ill of another Republican. Um, almost unprecedented to have one Republican committee chair publicly criticize and attack another committee chair in this way. And he wasn't the only prominent Republican to do that. You might recognize John McCain, who wrote an op-ed in the Chronicle of Higher Education where he said, the message sent by the Congressional Committee to the three scientists was not subtle, published politically unpalatable scientific results, and brace yourself for political retribution. It represents a kind of intimidation which threatens the relationship between science and public policy. That behavior must not be tolerated. Without precedent to see one Republican call out another Republican in this way. Um, and so I, I think it's a reminder that there, um, there have been heroes um, when it comes to uh, matters of the environment and science on both sides of the aisle. Um, it wasn't that long ago when climate change was not a, a partisan political issue in the U.S., but it's become one. And so it's, <laughs> hey, I haven't even said anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> so the next episode, uh, in 2009, um, there was so-called climate gate. Okay, so again, total coincidence. In the weeks leading up to the Copenhagen summit of December 2009, which was really the first opportunity for meaningful progress in dealing with climate change in years, suddenly there was this scandal 
thousands of emails um, stolen from a university server in the UK, and they had been combed through in individual words and phrases, cherry-picked from these emails to try to make it sound like climate change was the hoax that uh, James Inhofe had said it was, that climate scientists were cooking the data, were fudging the data, that it was, in fact, um, you know, all a massive hoax. <clears throat> and at the time, Sarah Palin wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post where she said that these emails reveal that leading climate experts, and experts is in the scare quotes here, because uh, you know, we don't have the expertise that Sarah has when it comes to uh, climate science. Um, they reveal that we deliberately destroyed records, no, we didn't, manipulated data to hide the decline in global temperatures. Now that's really interesting. Um, uh, in fact, uh, nine days later, the Washington Post published an op-ed by me in response, where I pointed out, among other things, that what she was talking about um, was an email. I was actually a recipient of that email. Uh, it was written in uh, early 1999, on the heels of the warmest year we had ever seen at the time, 1998. Climate scientists, if anything, at that point, would have been talking about the, the recent acceleration of global warming. And what they were actually talking about in that email was uh, in a cover graph that they were uh, creating for a non-technical audience. Um, they uh, didn't want to show uh, some bad tree ring data. Um, there were tree rings that after the 1960s were known to no longer accurately reflect temperatures. In fact, the uh, authors had written an article about that in Nature in 1998. Uh, it's called the divergence problem. The, the tree rings, stop, the trees stop responding to temperatures in the same way, so you shouldn't use them to depict temperatures, uh, especially to a non-technical audience that would take away the wrong uh, message if you showed these erroneous data. And, th and that's what he was talking about. I explained you know, this and some of the other things that Sarah Palin had gotten wrong in her op-ed, in my op-ed, and it seems to have even had an impact on Sarah Palin herself, because these are her words, okay? She later said a lot of those emails obviously weren't meant for public consumption. And she admitted they could be misinterpreted if taken out of context. Of course, those were her own emails that were released in response to a Freedom of Information Act request from her time as governor of Alaska. It didn't stop there. James Inhofe wanted to prosecute 17 climate scientists. He couldn't find 57 climate scientists, like in the movie The Manchurian Candidate, 57. No, he was only able to find 17 climate scientists who should be prosecuted for perpetrating the hoax of climate change as revealed by these stolen emails. And by the way, there have now been, I think, nine investigations in the US and the UK. Um, and uh, they have all come to the conclusion that there was no impropriety um, you know, uh, revealed by these stolen emails. There was no fudging of data. In fact, the only wrongdoing was the criminal theft of the emails in the first place, and the perpetrators were never caught. But that didn't stop folks like Inhofe from milking this for all this was worth. Well, they could, and so they wanted to prosecute 17 climate scientists. I'm proud to say I was among those 17 along with uh, Susan Solomon of MIT, the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Science, <laughs> highest uh, honor um, in, in, in our country for a scientist. It didn't stop there. Ken Cuccinelli was a so-called Tea Party Republican. And in that next spring, spring of uh, 2010, as incoming Attorney General of Virginia, his first act was to um, Oh, sorry, that's right, I forgot. His first act, he wanted to change the state seal of Virginia because it exposed part of the anatomy of the Roman goddess Virtus. He didn't think that was a family-friendly um, state seal. It was his second act as Attorney General was to take a page from the Joe Barton playbook and use his authority as Attorney General to demand, it might start to sound familiar, all of my personal emails. <laughs> with uh, more than 30 scientists around the world from the time that I was at the University of Virginia, um, based on uh, what's known as a civil investigative demand. Uh, this is uh, an, an instrument, a legal instrument, that is available to the Attorney General. Uh, it was designed to um, deal with Medicare fraud, uh, to ferret out state waste and fraud. But uh, he reasoned that you know, when I was at the University of Virginia, I was working on the science of, of climate change. And since it's clearly a fraud, it's clearly fraudulent, the science of climate change, this was a perfectly appropriate use of the civil investigative demand. Well, others didn't really uh, agree. Um, 
Uh, he was, uh, you know, these actions were uh, blasted uh, immediately with the Union of Concerned Scientists, the uh, ACLU, the AAUP, um, and even the conservative academic group FIRE um, that typically um, uh, advocates against what they see as political correctness um, from a sort of conservative political standpoint. Uh, they recognize it didn't matter, you know, what your politics were. It didn't matter whether you were conservative or progressive. The idea that an attorney general who didn't like an academic could use the weight of his office um, to go after them, uh, to uh, try to prosecute them, to persecute them. Uh, they didn't think that was a good idea regardless of what your politics are. Um, and so they weighed in against uh, what they saw as wrong. 800 scientists from the state of Virginia. I didn't realize there were 800 scientists in the state of Virginia signed an open letter um, demanding that the Attorney General cease and desist in this uh, attack against us, as did the AAAS, the American Meteorological Society, the journal Nature, and pretty much the entire scientific community. And even the conservative Richmond Times-Dispatch that had actually supported his candidacy um, for Attorney General um, blasted what they saw as a transparent effort to intimidate an academic. The Washington Post editorialized no less than five times against Cuccinelli's witch hunt. And their award-winning cartoonist Tom Tolles couldn't resist weighing in on the matter not once but twice. And I have to say this is my favorite here. It's Cuccinelli up there. and. It's Galileo down there, and he wants to see his emails too. And I don't mind being compared to Galileo, I guess. Uh, all right, so the civil subpoena was quashed on a, a technicality, uh, in fact. Um, in the 40-page filing, Cuccinelli's 40-page filing to the court, he had failed to provide evidence of wrongdoing on my part. Um, and so the court threw it out. Uh, he appealed to the state Supreme Court, which heard the case, and they rejected it with prejudice meaning we really don't want a, an attorney general to ever come back to the court with something like this again. Um, so that was a battle that was won uh, on the side of science. Um, and uh, I have to confess in some amount of schadenfreude um, in having had the opportunity to actively campaign uh, with his opponent. Um, Cuccinelli ran for the governor of Virginia in the last election. and. Uh, his uh, witch hunt against me in the, in the University of Virginia actually became um, a, uh, an issue in the campaign and it uh, worked against him. And I played a role in trying to help ensure that uh, Terry McAuliffe uh, become the next governor of Virginia. Now, Ken Cuccinelli, after losing, uh, took up a new job. Uh, he is actually helping run an oyster farm on an island, Tangier Island, in the Chesapeake Bay that's slowly succumbing to sea level rise. And I'm really not making this up. You can Google it. I'm not making this up. The attacks haven't stopped. Um, congressional Republicans want to try to defund climate research now. Um, and uh, they want to defund any climate research by the National Science Foundation. They want to try to defund any research by NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, um, that deals with climate. The word climate is not allowed um, in any science funding, uh, or at least that's the way they would like it. Uh, thus far, um, uh, it has not passed the US Senate. So yes, there have been a number of uh, Republicans who have sort of um, really uh, served as advocates for fossil fuel interests in trying to discredit the science of climate change, to try to intimidate the climate scientists themselves, including myself, but there have been some real heroes as well in the Republican Party. I already mentioned Sherwood Bullard, who back in 2010 wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post warning his fellow Republicans that if they continue to go down this road, they risked um, establishing their party, his party, the party that he loves, uh, as the party of anti-science, and they better not go there. And turned out that the, the witch hunts and the show trials that they had promised when they retook Congress, the, those didn't actually materialize. And so maybe, just maybe, it's because of stalwarts within their own party 
um, warned them uh, not to go there. And in fact, uh, there are Republicans like Bob Inglis, who actually lost his, he's a conservative Republican. In fact, he had a near perfect record from the American Conservative Union. Um, uh, but he's uh, an evangelical Christian who, who believes in stewardship uh, of the earth and believes that it is our duty to preserve creation and that we have to do something about climate change. And for speaking out about climate change on the floor of uh, the U.S. House of Representatives, um, he got in return a primary component who was funded with millions of dollars from the Koch brothers to make sure that he didn't get reelected in his safe seat in South Carolina. So now he's traveling around the country trying to convince conservatives to come on board, um, to put the anti-science behind them, and to engage in the worthy discussion about how to solve this problem, and in fact to make sure that conservative approaches to pricing carbon are part of that discussion. So solutions, okay? We have to get past this bad faith debate about whether uh, the problem exists. And I think there are some signs that maybe we're moving towards that in the US. We may not see a comprehensive climate bill come out of uh, Republican controlled uh, Congress uh, for a number of years, but we're seeing a lot of progress at the state level. In fact, the Western states have joined together with uh, British Columbia. We now have a consortium of carbon pricing along the west coast of the US. Um, we have a consortium of uh, carbon pricing um, uh, in the northeastern states. And in fact, uh, states that now account for 30% of the uh, US population are part of consortiums now for pricing carbon. So we're seeing progress at the state level. We're seeing progress at the presidential level. Um, uh, the president has enacted a clean power plan to help us shift away from coal towards renewable energy. The um, uh, president has raised uh, fuel efficiency standards um, to lower our carbon emissions from transportation. Um, you have other heroes like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who um, as governor uh, worked hard to make sure that California uh, be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Um, and uh, Jerry Brown, a Democrat, has now continued that legacy. And California has, again, joined together with other states to price carbon emissions to incentivize clean energy. Arnold Schwarzenegger is now an executive producer of a cable television series about climate change, um, the Years of Living Dangerously. And it has now been renewed. It's going into a second season. Um, and Arnold Schwarzenegger has actually helped to make that happen. He's using his star power to try to do something about climate change. And the question has been asked, is the solution to climate change in Vancouver? Um, here in BC, uh, you know, and the, the, uh, the, the carbon uh, tax, um, has proven uh, to be remarkably successful. It's shown that you don't destroy the economy when you impose a carbon tax. Um, you can actually help the economy. And I think uh, BC and Vancouver is actually helping sort of send a message um, to maybe the rest of Canada. We'll see what happens in October. Um, and um, there are reasons for cautious optimism. Good things are happening in Canada. Good things are happening in the US. The US and China reached this historic um, agreement last year um, to make dramatic uh, 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 decreases in their uh, carbon emissions. Uh, we are seeing uh, a real surge in renewable energy in, in the U.S. Um, in states like Texas and, and California. Um, so there are some reasons for cautious optimism as we head into this uh, summit in uh, Paris later this year, which um, you know may be our last opportunity to come to an international agreement that will hold warming below uh, dangerous uh, levels, below that two degrees Celsius level. Um, but now is the time to put pressure on our elected representatives to make sure that, that something good and important happens in Paris. And so now isn't the time for uh, you know, despondency. Um, uh, now, now is the time to, um, to, to make sure that we see this through and that we solve this problem. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I guess we're going to go on to the, um, the uh, next uh, the presentation, the respondent. Um, and we'll field questions after that. OK. Thanks.
Okay, I would like everyone to stand up and stretch for 30 seconds. Dr. Simard will come up to the front. Now, do you want to use this Oh. Oh, do you want to take the, oh, uh, all right, then we'll, I guess we'll field questions yeah. with that. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Um, Just because I didn't ask them for a second. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Put it in your maybe your inside pocket. I don't know. That'll work. I can't see if it's going on. Yeah, black on black. Is it might not be out. Okay. Oh. Done stretching. Please sit down. So we already heard about some uh, solutions. Um, and there's Vancouver right there, but that was fun. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Suzanne Simard from UBC. And Professor Simard is a um, forest ecologist in the Department of Forest Science. Um, and she, let me just go, where is it? View full screen mode. Okay, and she is um, a member of something called the S Sustainable Canada Dialogue. Sustainable Canada Dialogue, and she's going to tell us about what scientists in Canada have been doing um, to combat this or to sort of fight the fight. Is that a fair thing yes. to say? All right, so I turn um, the stage over to her. Thank you. So um, I got asked to do this a few days ago, so please forgive me if I stumble a little bit. <laughs> and, and I'm going to be reading from my notes. Um, so yes, I'm part of this Sustainable Canada Dialogues. There's uh, 65 of us across Canada. And we've put together, uh, under the leadership of Dr. Catherine Potvin um, at McGill University, who is the McGill Chair for Dialogues on Sustainability, um, we put together kind of a blueprint for change in Canada. And uh, we feel that it provides a consensus, a scholarly-based scientific consensus for what we can do in Canada that's very positive and that can move us forward. So um, Dr. Mann gave us a very eloquent uh, description of, of where climate change is going and some of the politics that have fallen out of that and the repercussions for his own life, which are very dramatic and moving to me. Um, and I, I think that we, we need to be careful not to become paralyzed by um, the fear of this kind of thing. I'm sure it was very scary for Dr. Mann at times. And, and as climate scientists, it, it, you know, it's, it's a very challenging time. Um, but when we act together and we collectively get together and move forward, we can actually do some very positive things. And, and I think that our Sustainable Canada Dialogue is one of those very positive things. Um, just to give you an idea of the importance of our dialogue, how many of you um, read the LEAP Manifesto in the last few days, came out with Naomi Klein in the last few days? Okay, so you might have, so the LEAP Manifesto is basically, um, it, it's a, a way forward for Canada to deal with climate change and a bunch of our other issues, um, our indigenous issues, poverty issues, um, and mostly to do with climate change. And notably, um, Naomi Klein and her colleagues um, actually relied on our scientific basis and our blueprint for the basis of their own blueprint. So um, it's very solid. And uh, so I'm going to go through it a little bit, not, not in great deal of, a great deal of detail, but I wanted to, before I did that, there's a couple things I wanted to mention. Um, so. The climate change skeptics, um, I think one of the arguments that they use and, and will continue to use, and we have a, a good abundance of them in Canada, even though all of us here are not, uh, I don't think climate change skeptics are, you probably wouldn't be here. Um, um, we have an abundance of them, and I think we still need to respond to their, um, the uncertainty that they put over, uh, 
our climate change predictions. And I just wanted to point to um, the, the fifth assessment report by the IPCC, which came out in 2013, that in, in that particular report, um, there was a lot of valid model validation that went on for um, the historic climate record. And that provides a validation for predictions into the future. So there's a great deal of, uh, of information in that report if you go to it on, on how well the models have been validated over the past century or even longer. And I just wanted to, to recount some of those things just, just to uh, put things in perspective. So um, the, 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 the report says that the current models are rep reproducing with very high confidence the large scale and regional surface temperatures over the historical period, including the past half century of rapid, more rapid warming and cooling after large volcanic eruptions, that it's reproducing large-scale patterns of temperatures during the last glacial maximum, um, that there's a very high confidence that uncertainties in cloud processes explain much of the spread in model climate sensitivity, that the models cap capture general characteristics of storms and cyclones, that the models are reproducing observed changes in the upper ocean heat content from 1961 to 2005, that the models are reproducing seasonal arc cycles of Arctic sea ice with an error of only less than 10%. Um, that the models are even reproducing northern hemisphere temperature variation in interannual and centennial timescales such as El Nino and the North Atlantic Oscillation. I think that this is, gives us a great deal of comfort, even if it's warm comfort, <laughs> um, that, that the models are, have improved greatly since the fourth assessment and that this should provide some comfort to those who are still uncertain or who are deniers or skeptics about climate change predictions. Okay, so with that, I'm just going to also then um, talk a little bit about Catherine Potvin and the this, this Sustainable Canada Dialogue. So Catherine Potvin is actually a tropical forest ecologist. I'm a forest ecologist. I understand Catherine a great deal. Um, so she was a UN, she was a negotiator with the UN United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in Rio in 1992, specifically on deforestation. And she did some negotiating um, in the ninth, or with Fort Panama, who in the 1980s were losing or deforesting at a rate of 50,000 hectares per year. And what Panama did was that they changed it around. They basically, through very positive um, incentivizations, stimulations for action, they basically turn things around. And so, since 2001, the rate of deforestation has been declining, and it's now at only 0.4% per year, or less than, um, uh, sorry, almost at, at zero net deforestation. In fact, between 2001 and 2010, there was an increase in forest area in pa Panama of 3,000 hectares. Now, to put that in perspective, in Canada, in Canada, we're deforesting, deforesting at the highest rate worldwide. You probably did not know that, did you? These are new numbers. But in the last 15 years, we've, uh, we've been deforesting. We deforested 20% of our forest lands. I mean, there is replanting going on, but we are deforesting at, at a rate of 4% per year. Now, if you think of 4% per year, if we're to grow trees on a 100-year cycle, which is a conservative estimate for our forest, we're over cutting or over disturbing our forest by four times. So Canada is lagging behind countries like Panama and Brazil. So speaking of Brazil, so Brazil as well um, in the 1990s was deforesting at a rate of 20,000 hectares per year. We all heard about this, the deforestation of the Brazilian Amazon. Um, Today, satellite photos show that their deforestation has declined by 70%. Okay, and they're almost at zero net deforestation. In fact, they're aiming for zero net deforestation in 2015. How did they do it? Well, they did many things, and I think that it speaks to what we can do as Canadians and what we're trying to do with the Sustainable Canada Dialogue. Basically, the people got together 
And with key pay players in politics, they were able to make big changes. So environmental groups, indigenous groups, human rights groups, NGOs got together. They made exposés of what was going on on their land, exposés of the royal, royal role of soy farming and beef farming and its role in deforestation. They expanded their network of indigenous forests and reserves. And then key players like the Green Party leader Marina Silva and the former president Luis de Silva um, all created a very positive dynamic for change. And so they're on a very positive trajectory now. Okay, so we can do the same thing. So I just, um, with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the dialogue. So we have come up with 10 action plans. Um, okay, let me see if I can do this. This just shows the different scholars across Canada. So there's 65 of us. In British Columbia, there's quite a few of us. Where are we? Up in the upper left-hand corner, a number from UBC, some from SFU, um, from UVic, and all centered at McGill University. OK. Sorry. OK. Um, so I mentioned that Catherine became or was motivated to start doing this during, in 1992 at Rio and she's been since working on this as part of her life ambition and she just put together this timeline to show um, how Canada has moved through this process too. So we entered into, um, we signed on to the FFSC framework in 1994 that we, were, we would be committed to keeping our greenhouse gas emissions lo low enough that we would only increase temperature by two degrees. Um, we signed on to Kyoto. We moved out of Kyoto in 2011, um, and we have certainly not met our commitments to, um, to the F FCCC. And this is just a figure that kind of shows that. Um, this is greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 to 2012 and how it compares to the Kyoto Accord and then the Copenhagen COP15 agreement where we promised to reduce um, our G GHGs by 17% by 2020 to, uh, to 2005 levels. Sorry, I'm short, sort of goofing that up. But anyway, we, we promised to reduce things, but we haven't. That's what that figure says. Okay, so um, now Catherine and the Sustainable Canada Dialogues, we ran a bunch of our own models um, within the framework of the IPCC models for Canada specifically. And the left-hand figure shows uh, projected temperature increases. Um, if we are to go to a, a low carbon economy within two decades and to 80% de reduction in greenhouse gases by 2050. And we can keep our, our, our mean annual temperatures at the surface below about two degrees over much of Canada. If we keep on the tra trajectory we're on right now, this is where we're headed in the far left-hand curve. So these are uh, average temperature increases in the Arctic areas of plus 14 degrees. Uh, in British Columbia and the western provinces around plus four degrees and then in um, middle of Canada and the eastern uh, plus six degrees. So business as usual is not heading us where we want to go, right? So the dialogue says, okay, we need to come up with some policy orientations for how do we address this. And our first policy orientation, which uh, reflects what Dr. Mann said, is we need to put a price on carbon. And yes, we do have our carbon tax in British Columbia, but we can do a lot more than that. Um, so putting a price on carbon means could be carbon taxing or it could be cap and trade. There's a, a number of vehicles that can be used, but it's an essential part of it. Um, the second policy orientation um, is to go for a, a low carbon uh, electri electricity production for our energy. And that's got to be part of our climate action plan. So moving away from fossil fuels and relying more on our electricity from hydroelectric and renewable, uh, renewable sources as well. And this figure um, just shows, you know, Canada has got a huge hydroelectric potential. We've got a huge wind potential and we've got a huge solar potential for creating electricity. And 
British Columbia, uh, Quebec especially, are very rich in hydroelectric power. It, they account, it accounts for about 25% of our energy, and it can account for 100% if we really move towards it in the next two decades. And part of the solution will be integrating a grid across Canada so that we can move that electricity around, so that the in-between provinces can also benefit from it. We can do it. Um, the third policy orientation is to integrate fossil fuel fuels into our climate action plans. So right now they're separate. We don't account for fossil fuels. In fact, we're subsidizing the fossil fuel into industry um, and we're not including it in, um, in our accounting. So we need to totally engage in it and, and integrate it um, and of course move away from it. Um, the fifth is energy usage. So um, Transportation is one of our biggest sources of greenhouse gases. It, well, it is our biggest source of greenhouse gases. There's many ways that we can in, improve the efficiency of our transportation system, including integration across Canada, but electrifying it, it more than it is now, um, doing more collaborative transportation. There's all kinds of solutions. Um, the sixth thing is better land use planning. So this means you know, better city planning, better transportation corridor planning. Um, where do we have people living that we can be more energy efficient? And there's some key uh, suggestions for that. Um, the seventh is to increase the energy efficiency of our buildings. That will have a huge effect on our greenhouse gas emissions. So increasing en energy efficiency of old buildings and building new ones to better standards. Um, and these last ones, um, natural assets and managing natural resources, that's my, where I have special specialization. I know that we can do way better in this area. And, uh, you know, generally natural resources are not even considered as part of climate action plans around the world. They're, they're not really given any credence, or not credence, but no, not much effort. And that's because they're not considered to be big emitters of greenhouse gases. But I can tell you that if we don't do something, the rate of disturbance to our forests and our natural lands is going to increase, and then it's going to become a much, much bigger problem than it is now. And so it's very important that we get start to manage those lands sustainably. And if we do these things, um, we can have progressive improvements. We can get there. And I do a lot of or studying and working with complexity science. And this is all about complexity science, where when you start moving along a trajectory, so if you look at the far right-hand corner, um, if you, we implement good policies and, and knowledge and we start to act on them, that it has this feedback, positive feedback effect, and we start to do better and better and better, and in time, we can get down to this minus 80% GSG emissions by 2050. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for listening. Thank you. So now we move to the, now do people want to stretch again or are you guys ready to just start talking? Ready to start talking? Stretch. Up and stretch if you want to. Now we have, um, Lori has a microphone and the floor is now open for questions and discussion. So as usual, please uh, use the mic and then I will repeat it back so everybody can hear it. And then I'll just pass the, you just stay hooked up. And I'll just pass the mic to um, Professor Mann, and let's talk about solutions. So, hands up already over here. Uh, this isn't really regarding solutions, but there's a couple of things that haven't been touched on that I just wanted to inquire about. And one was, so we talked a lot about fossil fuels, but what about the contribution of uh, particularly the meat industry to... Uh, to emissions and uh, the other thing is uh, abrupt climate change with uh, the uh, Arctic ice melting. Okay, so the that question who, is that, that's directed to either one of the speakers? Either. Okay, yeah. so we've talked about uh, CO2 from fossil fuels. Should we, how should we be thinking about other things like uh, other sorts My of emissions? My understanding is the agriculture industry is a very large contributor to greenhouse gas emissions as well. So how, how important is agriculture? 
Yeah, so I mean, there are multiple sectors uh, that contribute to our greenhouse gas emissions. In the U.S., uh, the primary uh, sector is power generation. Um, second is transportation. And actually, those are the, the two sectors that the, um, you know, the President of the United States has, has targeted through uh, EPA. Um, but there are contributions from deforestation, although those are actually diminishing. That's one of the contributions that we're starting to um, actually get uh, uh, to, to, to see some progress in decreasing. Um, and livestock, um, that includes uh, the raising of, uh, so both livestock and farming. Um, uh, cultivation, rice cultivation, agriculture. Uh, there is no, you know, single sector um, that, uh, w you know, by targeting alone, we can uh, achieve the, the sorts of reductions we need. We really have to address every single sector, and that includes livestock, it includes agriculture, and it includes uh, land use, um, deforestation, and, uh, of course, power generation, um, transportation. Those, uh, those are the two largest sectors um, uh, from the standpoint of uh, U.S. Uh, greenhouse gas contributions. Um, uh, yes, I've got a mic. Okay. Yes, I think that reflects what would, was as hap as well in Canada. Um, yeah. yeah. All of them. Okay. And now, and the second part of the question was the Arctic. So, abrupt climate, abrupt climate change. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, often uh, we are criticized as as scientists for being alarmist, uh, for supposedly overstating. Uh, the uh, the threat of climate change, but in many respects, if you actually look at the the model predictions and how they're stacking up against the observations, um, uh, the changes are actually happening even faster than we had predicted originally. Uh, that is true when it comes to the loss of ice from the the two major. Uh, continental ice sheets, the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet, which are contributing to sea level rise earlier than we expected. Um, it is true when it comes to the loss of, uh, of sea ice in the Arctic. Um, and so the Arctic is warming faster than we expected it to. Uh, we are seeing sea ice disappear at a faster rate than what the models predicted. Um, that uh, means that there is sort of an amplification of, of climate change. Uh, in the Arctic that is, of course, impacting, for example, uh, methane. There's a, a large amount of methane that's frozen in the permafrost of the Arctic. And as the Arctic warms faster than we expected, that means that there is this release of this uh, methane that has been frozen in the permafrost um, for many thousands of years. Um, Methane is also a potent greenhouse gas, um, so it's what we call a positive feedback. Um, a positive feedback isn't a good thing. In this case, it's a bad thing. It means that we get even more warming because the methane is released into the atmosphere. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas, adding further to the warming, accelerating the melting. Um, now, uh, there is the possibility of so-called tipping point, uh, abrupt climate change. You refer to um, another term that's sometimes used is a tipping tipping point where uh, rather than uh, seeing the climate change smoothly, uh, we see it undergo a, a rapid transition from one state to another state. And there's some concern that there are tipping points when it comes to the melting of the ice sheets. Um, there is sort of a, a potential point of no return once you start melting the ice. There are again these positive feedbacks that further accelerate it and you can't stop it. Um, that uh, may be true uh, when it comes to the release of uh, permafrost, uh, methane frozen in the permafrost, although uh, that isn't clear. There's a debate right now in the scientific community as to really how much uh, permafrost methane is, is potentially uh, mobilizable um, uh, through uh, warming. Um, there is the potential of a shutdown in the pattern of ocean circulation uh, that we sometimes refer to as the Gulf Stream, uh, although technically it's a, um, the Gulf Stream is a, is a 
is a wind-driven current, and uh, this circulation pattern, the thermohaline circulation, um, is driven by temperature contrasts and uh, changes in the density of seawater. And as you melt lots of ice and you decrease the density of the surface waters, you can inhibit the sinking motion that drives that ocean circulation pattern. There's some evidence that we are seeing a weakening in that pattern, um, and there's the possibility that it could uh, it, it could um, you know, exhibit a, a fairly rapid uh, shutdown. There's some models that uh, that show that happening rapidly. There are other models that have it more as a slow, steady decrease. So there are uncertainties, but in many respects, the uncertainties, um, you know, are, are not. Uh, working out in our favor. And so when people say there's uncertainty and, and that's a reason for inaction, uh, arguably the opposite is true. Um, the fact that there are uncertainties means that uh, there's the distinct possibility that things could be quite a bit worse than what the models project. And historically, that is seeming to be more the pattern, um, that things are happening faster than we had predicted, that we, in some respects, have been too conservative with our model projections. So uncertainty is not a reason for inaction. Um, it, it's a reason for even uh, faster and, and more concerted action. Right. Over here. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing up the forestry issue. I think it's really not in the media very much. Uh, the opposite propaganda that we're doing very well mm -hmm. makes it into the media. And I found it interesting with our hot summer that uh, they're not sure if any of the planting that they did, that they sort of rely on as a, a boost for what they take down and deforest may not take. So they're not sure what the ratio of those plantings is. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. But my question is, uh, I'm hearing in the media a lot people saying we must leave all fossil fuels in the ground to have a chance. And I'm wondering if you feel this is a really good rally and cry to uh, step behind. So the question is, and some people heard that because I see her. The question is, is it a good strategy, is it a good rallying cry to suggest that we have to leave much of, or all, of the fossil fuel that's still in the ground, in the ground? So I think both of you might have something to say about that. Yeah, so th there was a study that uh, was published uh, recently, um, I think it was in Nature, although uh, uh, um, uh, suggesting that we have to leave 80% of known fossil fuel reserves in the ground if we are to avoid crossing that two degrees Celsius dangerous limit. Um, so it's not quite 100%, but 80% uh, uh, means that essentially you know, if you do the math on that, it means no Keystone XL pipeline. It means no tar sands. Um, it, it means that natural gas is not the solution. Um, uh, and it means that uh, we really have to stop burning coal. Uh, um, yeah, I'm going to, sorry, I keep forgetting I've got, the, I've got this thing on me. I just wanted to comment on the, on the forestry part as well, and I agree with Dr. Mann about leaving the carbon in the ground. Um, um, there's major changes going on in our forests now that we don't know as the public is going on. Um, there is lots of mortality in our forests, in the old forests and the young forests. And... Uh, we do plant, but we're, there's so much more we can do to increase the diversity and the, the basic the carbon budgets in those forests. And uh, I think you know we need to pressure our governments to do better because there's been a real decline in what we've been doing over the last decade. Um, the forests have the capacity to sequester a, quite a lot of carbon, but they also have the capacity to release a lot of carbon, and that's what we've seen um, over the last 10 years is that become a next source of carbon. Um, into the atmosphere. In my own work, you know, I look at young forests, and what, what, one of the things that we've been able to use through dendrochronology is look at drought effects on the health of forests and how it's predisposing them to different vulnerabilities. And the tree ring records, even in young forests, show that when we go into these droughts that the forests are very vulnerable, and that's when they get hit by especially by mountain pine beetle, western spruce budworm, whatever, you know, there's a million different diseases and insects out there that are ready to, to, to pounce on stressed trees. I mean, it's just part of their cycle, but under increasing stress, it becomes more of a, of a problem. So there, there is much more we can do to increase the amount of um, carbon that our forests are sequestering. So. All right, so 
Lori, yeah. Uh, yes, just a comment and then a question for Dr. Brandon. Comment, there was an article in the Globe and Mail about two days ago quoting a couple of Canadian researchers pointing out that Canada was not including deforestation or land use change in our, what is it, INDCR, basically our submission to the Paris COP at the time until I heard you tonight. I wondered why would we omit that when we have so many forests, but there may be a link and if you've got any comment to make about that omission from Canada's national plan, that would be interesting. For Dr. Mann, a question, which is, uh, like your climate change models, there's up and down, but has there been any trend line uh, less in the degree of, shall we say, extreme climate uh, denier attacks on scientists like yourself in the last 18 months? Uh, has, or are we, based, is the kind of that segment of opinion which you detailed and you know from direct experience trending pretty much as normal and because it's a big current of opinion or has a big political base in your country and, and it's reflected elsewhere? So, first question or ask for comment, why are, is, is the forest forest carbon budget not in the current plan going to Paris? So do you want to... Um, it, from what I understand, it's because uh, the emissions from, from forests and deforestation is so small compared to our transportation, um, our buildings, um, those, in the fossil fuel sector, it's, it's small. So it, there just has not been the attention paid on it and it's considered to be irrelevant compared to those other things. Doesn't mean that it, it's not important, it is very important. And now, are climate deniers growing or shrinking in number? <laughs> So, um, like the climate, there is interannual variability, uh, <laughs> and uh, and there is a, a trend. I interestingly, um, as at least in the U.S. and I think this is true in Canada as well, um, outright denial of the basic science uh, is just becoming less and less credible because the public is seeing climate change play out, you know, before their eyes, and so it becomes increasingly difficult um, to d deny that it's happening. Um, so. We've seen sort of a shift to well, it's happening, but you know, uh, maybe it's natural or in large part natural. Um, uh, in the U.S., there was a trend where uh, Republicans who were asked about climate change, who, who didn't really want to have to weigh in, um, denying that climate change exists, would say, well, you know, I'm not a scientist, uh, mm -hmm. and that was their response: is I don't have to have an opinion about it um, uh, because I'm not a scientist, uh, which of course is is absurd. It's like asking. You know, uh, should I, you know, take this cyanide pill? Uh, well, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I can't tell you if that's. Uh, <laughs> and and so we've seen them playing with different kinds of messaging um, and this sort of tap dance, this effort to avoid actually weighing in about what we really need to do about the problem. Um, there has been an emergence of what I call sort of a, a, a kinder and gentler uh, form of denialism uh, more recently, which is to stay, say that well, the impacts of climate change have been overstated um, and the solution isn't you know getting off fossil fuels, the solution is letting the market innovate, um, letting the market, uh, letting technology, uh, you know, allowing, uh, allowing industry to to, to, to flourish and they'll just sort of solve this problem uh, on their own um, when in fact there's really no evidence that uh, that uh, sort of policy uh, could possibly keep greenhouse gas uh, emissions below dangerous levels. So there, there has been um, this uh, movement away from outright denial that climate change is happening to denying that it's a problem or that much of a problem or you know in some cases simply you know, uh, you know, sort of blaming it on, you know, the rest of the world, China. Well, you know, why should we do anything about this problem when, you know, China is, you know, continuing to emit, uh, you know, greenhouse gases? Uh, when, you know, the I irony there is that China is actually doing quite a bit more right now than the U.S. is. They're investing a whole lot more in renewable energy. Uh, China is instituting a regional carbon trading uh, program, so they're actually putting a price on carbon. Um, and the interesting thing about China is it's a very top-down uh, uh, governmental structure, so they can act quickly. Um, and they are, in fact, acting. Uh, so that's no longer a viable excuse uh, for those who say, well, you know, what about China. Yeah, what about China? <laughs> China is actually doing something. Good question. Yes, sir. 
A uh, question for Dr. Ben. What can you tell me about the calculation of the global average temperature that would lead, give it credence? This, this is the basic data that all the models are using, and I frankly don't understand the concept of a global average temperature. Which temperatures are measured, and where, and how are they put together to come to this number? And for our Canadian colleague, um, what are the subsidies to fossil fuels in Canada? Okay, Thank you. so two questions. Yes. First, for Professor Mann, what is a global average temperature, and why do we talk about it? Right, so, uh, you know, the, the global average temperature is, you know, it... What, what we actually measure isn't literally the global average temperature because, for example, temperatures uh, vary, uh, you know, drop by, you know, between 6 and 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer in the atmosphere. So if, you know, if, if you go, if there are changes in elevation, well, then there are going to be changes in temperature associated with that. So what we actually measure, we don't literally try to estimate the temperature in absolute degrees over the entire surface of the Earth. We measure departures of temperature from some baseline. Um, so typically, we call it a, a temperature anomaly. Now, you can actually calculate what the approximate surface temperature of the Earth has to be um, to uh, be in balance with the incoming uh, solar radiation. You can do calculations that tell you what the approximate average temperature is. But what we're really interested in is the change in temperature. And we can measure that quite accurately. We have a, a very rich network of observing stations um, over land. We have long-term observations uh, over the oceans, uh, large parts of the ocean in the northern hemisphere, somewhat sparser in the southern hemisphere. So we have a better handle on what the average temperature is of the northern hemisphere. Uh, uh, l more uncertainty um, in the average temperature changes again, changes in average temperature over the entire surface of the globe. Uh, one of the things that scientists do is we can actually use models to test um, some of the sampling questions. How diverse a network uh, do you need to estimate the average change in temperature over the entire surface of the Earth? It turns out that temperatures are highly correlated. Temperature variations are highly correlated from one place to another. So you don't literally need to be measuring at every location. You need a network of measurements that's rich enough that you're sampling uh, the large-scale changes in the temperature field. And when you look at those uh, plots of, of temperature change, often they'll come with error bars. You'll see some shading, and that shading is actually showing you what the uncertainty is associated with the, the sampling, the, um, the uncertainties in sampling. Um, and they're fairly small. They're quite small compared to the overall trend of a, of a degree Celsius. And so uh, we know that we're measuring temperature temperatures and temperature changes accurately enough to assess the trend uh, within, you know, a, a, a few percent. Okay, I just wanted to add a, a, a little bit about temperature then. Um, Temperature extremes are also really important, and they're not often taken, or they're not really taken or shown in these mean annual temperature changes. And in our natural forests and in, you know, in our lands where we're dealing with resources, those extremes can have a huge impact. And so it's something that I think we haven't paid enough attention to, and it would be, I think we can do a lot better in trying to understand these extremes. And I just was uh, noticing in the IPCC report, they do talk about extremes in their model ver verifications, and say, and admit that there's very, there's not, it's not a very good correspondence or a good predictor. Um, um, but but it is important to try and get a handle on those extremes because those are the things that really can result in things like failures of crops or plantations or um, because they come along at unexpected times and they can wipe things out very, very quickly. So it, it, I think it's a good, something we should work towards. As far as the fossil fuel subsidies, I'm afraid I don't understand that myself. I, I don't... I'm not an expert on that at all. I know it's something that's talked about in the, by the Sustainable Canada Dialogues. It's something that, that the Green Party and the different political parties talk about, but I'm not actually conversant in, in those subsidies. Are you? So, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. So next week, we have an economist, Chris Hope, coming from Cambridge, and the respondent is Mark Jacquard, who will know what the fossil fuel subsidies are in Canada. I can bet my suit jacket that he will know 
what they are. So if you come next week, we can ask the exact same question because I think that's the sort of thing that he actually studies for a living. So, because I don't know what they are either. Just one comment on this because uh, this, uh, um, this is a matter that came up uh, earlier this week. Um, there was a statement signed by a large number of scientists, and including myself, um, that uh, has to do with the uh, leasing of public lands uh, for fossil fuel uh, extraction. And so in essence, that is a subsidy. Um, fossil fuel companies get extremely cheap uh, leases, uh, you know, on the order of a couple dollars uh, per acre uh, per year to um, you know to, to, to mine uh, those lands for uh, fossil fuels and so in essence that's a subsidy uh, from the from the, the taxpayer um, in the form of, of uh, unreasonably low uh, leases on land that um, otherwise uh, would, would would be leased at a higher value thank you next yes sir yeah, I was just wondering uh, your thoughts on geoengineering and how desperate do we get before that is a solution or an action that's actually on the table. So this is a great question that's come up um, in previous to previous speakers. When do we start thinking seriously about geoengineering? And maybe you can say give an example of what geoengineering is. So go for it. Sure. So um, you know. There are various forms of so-called geoengineering. Arguably, uh, we are engaged in geoengineering, uh, accidental geoengineering, by uh, fossil fuel burning. We are literally changing the planet. We're changing the composition of the atmosphere. We're warming the planet. That's sort of an, uh, an unintended geoengineering. And so the uh, thought uh, has been, um, you know, among some uh, uh, proponents uh, that uh, maybe we can do something else to the climate system to, to try to offset that. Um, and some of these schemes really uh, seem like the stuff of science fiction. Um, uh, they involve putting giant mirrors in space uh, or large numbers of mirrors in space to reflect back some of the incoming sunlight, um, shooting uh, particles up into the stratosphere, much like what a volcanic eruption does, but we take cannons full of these uh, same particular and we fire them up into the stratosphere and if we do it often enough we can mimic uh, the effect of having a Pinatubo like eruption every few years and if you do the calculations that in theory would be enough to offset the global warming due to increasing greenhouse gas concentrations uh, the problem is it, it's really the principle of unintended consequences and that really reigns supreme in discussions of geoengineering because many of these schemes when you look at them in more detail when you start testing um, how they might actually play out with theoretical climate models. You find, for example, that the pattern of cooling due to the uh, the uh, particulates uh, you're shooting into the stratosphere uh, is not the mirror image of the pattern of greenhouse warming. So you don't offset global warming everywhere. Some regions actually will warm even faster. Um, some regions will cool. Um, simulations that have been done suggest that you will actually slow down the so-called hydrological cycle. cycle. You'll dry out the continents. Um, uh, things could go awry. What you're talking about doing is toying with a, a system that we don't understand perfectly and we're sort of hoping that uh, magically we'll be able to offset uh, the effect of one intervention through some other intervention. But it's just as likely that we will end up worse off um, because of, again, unintended consequences that we didn't foresee, that we weren't able to capture with the modeling experiments. Um, some forms of geoengineering are, are relatively safe. Uh, there's uh, what's known as air capture, open air capture. You literally suck the CO2 back out of the atmosphere. Uh, now, as you might imagine, you're sort of fighting the laws of thermodynamics when you do that, and you're fighting the laws of economics. And what I find uh, remarkable is that many of the proponents of uh, geoengineering are extreme techno-optimists when it comes to our ability to manipulate the Earth system. But you ask them, you know, well, what about scaling up renewable energy? Oh, no, it just isn't possible. There's just no way we can do it. 
Um, and so there's this <laughs> disconnect in terms of their techno optimism. Uh, you know, they're, and, and I think it does betray um, a you know maybe sort of an ideological bent. Um, those who uh, support the idea of geoengineering want to sort of have their cake and eat it. We continue to burn fossil fuels, but we'll do something else and and, and hope that uh, it ends up offsetting global warming. Uh, I particularly, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, um, uh, again, uh, many of these geoengineering schemes are extremely unwise. Uh, there's another, I'll just very briefly, um, seeding the oceans with iron to try to increase the uptake of carbon in the upper ocean. And there was a rogue experiment that I think was done somewhere off uh, the coast of, uh, of British Columbia um, where somebody, you know, a for-profit venture that was going to do um, iron seeding to sell carbon credits um, um, ended up uh, sort of engaging in an uh, unauthorized uh, uh, experiment. And we don't fully know what the ecological consequences of some of these interventions, what they might be. There's some science that uh, suggests that it, it, you could end up actually favoring the types of algae, um, the sort of dangerous algae, the red tide algae. We could end up changing the ecology of the ocean in a way that's very adverse. And so, once again, uh, to me, the, it's really the principle of unintended consequences. Um, you know, the simplest solution is to stop putting the carbon into the atmosphere. And it's very likely the cheapest solution as well. Thank you. Uh, so, Lori, yep. This is a question for both of you. I was wondering uh, what kind of things keep you optimistic when you wake up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you? Sm what can you tell us that makes you smile when you wake up in the morning with reference to climate change? Other than my children. Um, you know, in, in complexity science theory, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of attention paid to feedbacks and interactions. And um, you can have negative feedbacks which dampen things and positive feedbacks that amplify things. And uh, these feedbacks can lead to um, unpredictable things and negative and positive things. And um, I think that there's, there's a lot of really good news stories around the world, such as Brazil's um, response to deforestation, their response to the AIDS problem. Brazil is actually at the forefront of lots of major changes and it's because of this they use kind of a complexity science approach to things. That, that, that they have grassroots movements, people get together, they're, they're collectively thinking, and they make changes. And they are big changes, right? They're not just little incremental changes. They're like, okay, let's move along, and suddenly there's a big change. And that's where the hope is. The hope is that we have that capacity as human beings to make major shifts. That's what makes me smile in the morning, other than my children. Uh, I'll add to that. Um, you know, uh, there, there's a, a saying that I, I, I really like. Uh, a colleague of mine is fond of saying that you know the you know, the, the, the Stone Age didn't end for want of stones, um, <laughs> and um, and in the same sense, the the fossil fuel age is not going to end for want of fossil fuels. We've got five times as much, by some estimates. Uh, fossil fuels in known reserves, that's ne five times as much as is necessary to put us over that two degrees Celsius danger zone. So uh, we can't afford to expend all of the uh, available fossil fuels to burn all the available fossil fuels. Um, but what we're seeing is that um, you know that 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 technology is, is becoming antiquated. Uh, we're seeing a remarkable revolution around the world in clean energy and renewable energy, and, and it's clear that that is going to be, you know, the the energy economy of the 21st century is going to be, be a clean energy economy. And those uh, nations that recognize that um, and uh, and seize you know uh, uh, upon that um, are, are are going to prosper. And and we're, so even here in the U.S., in Canada, um, we're seeing remarkable inroads, more remarkable gains. Uh, there was more fossil, uh, there was more renewable energy capacity added globally last year than fossil fuel energy capacity for the first time ever. Last year, for the first time ever, we saw no increase in net carbon emissions with a growth in the global economy. 
um, some evidence that maybe we're starting to see the decoupling of our economy from fossil fuels. So there are good things that are happening. Um, they're not quite happening fast enough to avoid two degrees warming of the planet. And what that means is that we have to help that along. And the way we do that is by leveling the, uh, you know, the, 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 the playing field uh, when it comes to the energy marketplace by putting a price on the emission of carbon so that renewable energy uh, can compete fairly. Uh, energy that isn't destroying the planet has a chance to compete fairly against energy sources that are. Um, so I, I'm optimistic that we're already turning the corner. We just need to, to help that transition along through proper incentive structure. Yes. Uh, hi, that, that answer was actually a perfect prelude to the question I was going to ask. Um, and it's uh, to both of you, but it's in reference to, a question, uh, to something brought up in the second presentation. Uh, and that is about, uh, you, uh, the, in the second presentation, you mentioned about how hydroelectric dams uh, could, and the increase in hydroelectric dams could be um, a good alternative uh, to the current use of fossil fuels in electricity generation. And I guess I just wanted to ask, based on that, you know, hydroelectric electric dams also can have a significant impact on the environment, uh, especially when it comes to river systems and the uh, uh, ecosystems surrounding them. So I guess my question to both of you would be, uh, is there uh, an ideal or a better uh, slash best form, I know there's no best form of anything, but is there a, a, a more ideal form of uh, renewable energy? Um, you know, is there, a, what are some of the issues that surround uh, some, that some, some of the renewable energy generation when we're talking about solar or geothermal, hydroelectric, uh, you know, is there a form of, of that kind of renewable energy that is less has less of a negative impact on the environment because obviously even renewable forms of energy do have an impact on the environment. Right. That's my very long-winded question. So the question <laughs> is, are some forms of renewable energy better than others? Yeah. And which one? So, yeah, every action has a consequence, right? Like we don't get anything for free. And I didn't actually say we should increase hydroelectric. I think we can redistribute the hydroelectric that we have. So we export a lot of hydroelectricity across the border to the US. Um, we could actually change that structure and supply our own country in more efficiently through redistribution of that hydroelectricity. I'm not saying that we should shut down trade with the U.S. at all, but we could be more intelligent about how we, use, we do use what we generate. And I think we also, there's a great deal of potential in Canada to use wind and solar power that we have not capitalized on. I don't know what the environmental consequences of those things are, but we certainly need to research it and try it out because it's, it's a viable, I think a very viable solution. And, and just one more comment, you know, as there's more and more people on the planet, there's more demand for energy. So we should look to our population growth as well. Yeah, um, no, I, I, I second all of that. Um, and, uh, you know, there, it, it, once again, there is the, the principle of unintended consequences. When you engage in some very large-scale deployment of, 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 of technology, there's the chance that, uh, that there will be unintended consequences. With hydroelectric, you know, when you start, um, uh, you know, with dams, uh, there's the potential for increased methane release because you have still water, you allow anaerobic uh, organisms that produce methane, to thrive, um, so there's always the possibility that you know hydroelectric um, uh, damming could uh, actually lead to increased methane emissions. And methane again is a more potent greenhouse gas than CO2, although it isn't around as long, so it becomes very complicated. Um, so there's a wonderful quote I came across um, uh, earlier this year, for, uh, and I and I checked it, and it really is an authentic quote by Thomas Edison. Um, uh, who in the early 20th century said something, you know, they asked him about, you know, what, 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 how, what did he see as the, the future of uh, energy? And he said, I really hope that, you know, I don't know, 50 years from now, um, you know, we're not still burning fossil fuels, that, you know, we've got this amazing resource in the sun, and I really hope that we tap that. And that's Thomas Edison, you know, 100 years ago, or almost 100 years ago. So, uh, you know, the sun, why aren't we tapping the sun? 
um, as, to the extent possible. Uh, wind, you know, to me, wind and solar are no-brainers. Um, and, you know, people will raise issues, objections. For example, there's the issue of bird catch um, with, with wind uh, turbines. Uh, although, you know, if you, the, the Audubon Society, um, you know, I, I, I trust to represent, uh, you know, uh, concerns uh, when it comes to bird populations, has said that this is really a minor, um, you know, I impact and it's much more important uh, for the environment, including birds and all other living things, to, to get away from fossil fuels. So given that that trade-off, we'll go with them. Um, so you know, we'll go with wind power and solar, and you know, it. Yes, there are potential unintended consequences with any massive deployment of a, a new technology, but the alternative is clearly worse. Hmm. Right. And I should point out, we have five more minutes. We're going to take at least two more questions. To point out, in two weeks, Dr. David Boyd will be giving a talk called The Optimistic Environmentalist Planning for a 100% Renewable Future Futures. And we'll have someone from the city of Vancouver talking about what Vancouver is doing, too. So some of, the, some of what we're discussing here will be taken up again. Okay, so there's a question here in the front. I have a few concerns and one question. So my first, um, so it seems logical to me that with the increase of economic growth, um, the goal of the global warming is also worse. Uh, so my concern is that um, it is paradoxical that it is, um, for me, it is impossible to me that the economic growth um, uh, also, uh, increase with the climate change, I mean, the sustainable sustainability growth, because uh, if we want to be the, um, the environment to be sustainable, the economics also have to be changed a lot, the structure needs to be changed a lot. And it seems to me that the current economy does not support the, the, the sustainability of the, the climate change. And we, I think we are rational and we do not want things that are expensive. And if, for example, if I have, um, if I am not wealthy, I cannot buy an electric car, electrical car. So it is impossible to me to buy a very expensive car because the cost of sustainability is so high. And the second uh, problem to me is that our hardcore belief and our hardcore everyday uh, activities um, oh, increase the problem of global warming. For example, we eat meat and raising meat uh, produce methane, which is uh, uh, terribly damaged the, um, the, 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 the environment. And we drive cars every day and we, we use air conditioners. And this is very harmful to our, in our environment. And it seems hard to me to um, uh, develop the sustainability. And the th third problem is that uh, I think all the problems need to be solved before the climate change needs to be solved. For example, population, poverty. Because if this problem will not be solved, uh, climate change also cannot be solved. So uh, my question is that, is there any way? So can we solve the problem of, uh, of global warming if without solving the problem of populations and poverty? Thank right. you. Right. So the, the question, I think, and it's a extremely fundamental question. Given the uh, economic system we have, and given the psychology that we have, is it, why do we think that we can solve the global change or the climate change problem on its own without solving, without dealing with some of these other issues, and in particular, having more people on the planet that want more things? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a valid concern. Uh, it's the thesis of, of a new book by Naomi Klein, whose yeah. name came up earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I, for, I forgot the title of her new book. Uh, it, uh, uh, 
this yes, change. this changes everything. Thank you. Uh, and so the, the basic thesis of, of her book is that there's a fundamental inconsistency between um, sustainability and a market uh, economy. Okay. And uh, it's, it's obviously a controversial thesis. Um, and yet, you know, if you're... There is some evidence now to the contrary. I, I actually think it's a wonderful book. I think she, she, she makes a compelling case. She makes a, a good case. I happen to not be convinced that it's correct. And, and, I, and I think um, there's some evidence of that in the, the numbers that came in last year, where we do appear to be turning the corner. We grew the global economy without an increase in carbon emissions. Now, just flatlining carbon emissions isn't enough. We have to bring them down dramatically if we're going to avoid you know, potentially catastrophic warming of the planet. So that alone uh, isn't evidence that we're solving the problem, but it is evidence of the possibility of a decoupling from global economic growth uh, decoupling of global economic growth from uh, carbon emissions. But there are larger, you know, re uh, very valid questions about whether it is possible to live sustainably while continuing to grow the global economy um, uh, because that inquire, you know, requires, you know, ongoing use of resources, um, expending energy. Um, so that's, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> um, but, but that is the challenge. Um, and it's a challenge, you know, that I think we, we have to meet uh, to find a way to live sustainably while meeting the needs of a growing global population. Now, you know, the demographic projections um, uh, used to have global population flat, flattening out uh, mid-century. Um, and that's because of sort of an underlying assumption that as the rest of the world sort of industrializes, um, that they will adopt sort of the, um, uh, the population patterns of industrial nations. Um, and that'll flatten out uh, global population growth. But uh, some recent revisions um, suggest that, that we, we may not max out at 9 billion. We can't rule out 11 billion people on the planet. And with 11 billion people on the planet, there, there's an identity called the Kaya identity where you can sort of calculate what the carbon emissions uh, should be given a product of various factors that have to do with efficiency and how carbon intensive economy we have. But the first number in that formula, the first factor is global population. All other things being equal, more people means more energy use, means more carbon emissions if we're, if we're burning carbon to get that energy. So that remains a challenge. Uh, and if we climb to 11 billion people, um, there are some real legitimate questions about whether we can continue to meet the energy and food, water, and land resource needs of 11 billion people on a planet with finite resources. Uh, there are many ecologists who say we're already exceeding the carrying capacity of the Earth, and with 11 billion people, well, that that's going to be a challenge. Yeah, I'm. I just wanted to comment your co your observation that equity and is a really important issue too. So not only population growth, but how we distribute our wealth amongst the population is, I think, a key underpinning principle to how we get to a sustainable economy. Not just the economic models, but how we deal with people, our, our relationships with each other, our respect for each other, our respect for our environment. Those are all fundamental underlying issues that I think can help solve our problems. So I think it's clear it is now past 9 o'clock, so I think we're going to cut off um, um, questioning. I think it's clear that the solutions themselves are ext ex extremely complex. I would remind you that the, the next two weeks, the speakers that are going to be here will be speaking to exactly these sorts of issues. So we're going to have the uh, Chris Hope, uh, who worked on the Stern Report about how much um, global chain, uh, climate change is costing us. He is an economist. Mark Jacquard is an economist. They can deal with some of these issues. And David Boyd, in two weeks, will be talking, uh, we're taking a week off, on October 15th, will be talking about switching to renewable energies. And I, he has also written a book on how you get there and also deals with some of this, these growth issues as well. So I think this conversation is going to continue. Having said that, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank our speakers for two hours on stage. So uh, please join me in thanking them. Thank you.
board, do you have any announcements? If there, do you have any announcements? If there are no other announcements, tell your friends to come next week, and we'll see all of you, hopefully, next week, same time, same place.